excuse me, thermostatic switch in the car. When it reached the temperature, the set point, it would shut off. And when it got back up, we warmed back up, it would, it would turn it on. Problem with that is the, the big temperature swing. It, there has to be a, a difference between the, the on and the off point. And again, with uh, automotive under, uh, under driving conditions, uh, there would be big, big swings in temperature and humidity. A uh, good example is some of the home air conditioning systems where the system turns off. Uh, you know, when you're under com comfort conditions, the system turns off, sometimes gets humid and hot before it turns back on. Again, early, early thermostatic condition, thermostatic control of conditions. Again, 
there were changes all throughout the year. There were almost hourly changes in the control scenario that uh, uh, Cadillac and the other, uh, the other air conditioning manufacturers used. And at the end, it went as they tried something and it worked or didn't work, they would, they would change it. But this is the uh, uh, 71 to, it's basically 71 to 76 version. Again, you, we have eliminated the, the deck sensor because they found it wasn't that effective, wasn't that necessary. Again, the duct sensor was in there because they were still concerned with overcooling the car and thermal shock. The primary purpose of this system was to deliver comfort conditions without drafts. Now, in today's air conditioning, the more drafts you get, the more cold air you can, they can blow on you, the happier you are. But back then, they didn't want drafts. And this system was designed to eliminate drafts. Okay. Uh, yeah. The go to uh, figure four and we'll go back. These are, this, these are the resistance curves of the ambient sensor and the incline sensor. So you see as the temperature, and here's the temperature. As the temperature goes down, the resistance goes up on, the, on these thermistors. So at, I'm getting myself behind and ahead of myself at the same time. Cover the, let's go back to uh, figure four. Let's, let's figure out. Uh, yeah. um, Later, later version, the amplifier has gotten a little smaller. The later components got a little smaller. It still does the same thing. What happens is the sensor strain feeds the, amp feeds the voltage to the amplifier, and the amplifier feeds an output voltage to the transducer. That's this little device here uh, on 64 to 70, I guess. Uh, they've got the, the, the transducer, it's a big long tube under the, uh, under the dash on the passenger side. And what that does is modulates vacuum. And, and what that vacuum does is controls, <laughs> best laid plan of the mice in number six, please. Okay, and what that vacuum does, there's that transducer, there's that transducer. The one, this is the vacuum side of the system. The electronics, electrical side, provides a volt, zero to 10 volt signal to the transducer. And what that transducer does is takes vacuum from the engine source and provides a zero, basically zero to full vacuum signal to the power servo. And what that does at zero voltage, zero voltage uh, input to the transducer, the zero voltage to the transducer, Zero voltage to the transducer. Transducer is, is it open or closed? system goes to heat. 
Yeah, I'd, like, I'd like just to interrupt you at that point and ask a question. Yeah. Would, it be true, you. would it be true to say that the, you know, my understanding is that 1980s when they started to go to electronics, uh, you know, 79 didn't have a digital thing on the dash. So it the sort of first introduction of electronics was really 1980. Would it be fair to say that those early 80s systems were pretty similar to the previous ones with the exception of the display on the dash? The, the early electronic systems? Yeah. The yeah. early electronic systems are very, very similar to the previous ones. There's a, a melding from the, the, the basic system. Uh, let's go back one, one, two. This one. There's a, a melding, if you will, from this basic system, this rudimentary crude system, to the uh, to the to the electronic, and it sort of slid through several iterations. I've got a '79 that's got a basically the same system as the 76 uh, and then the next year they went to an electronic control head okay. and if I'm not mistaken that's all they did the actuators and the dampers and everything else was identical to the uh, to the to the older system but now that I've got everybody confused with sensors actuators uh, I want to go back to mm, You know what? We have the we have you got the thumb drive in there. Mm -hmm. uh, can you get back and, and go back to the uh, the first seminar? The first. I can hope. Okay. Next time I present this, it will I will integrate more the first into the second. I thought I could just separate the two of them. No, no. Neither one of these. Power, PowerPoint. This guy. That one. And then go up the top. Click on that. PowerPoint. Okay. Uh, first one. There we go. Okay. and with, with these sensors, we're basically controlling two things. We're controlling the three things, I guess. We're, talk, we're con controlling the airflow, we're controlling the direction of the airflow, and we're also controlling the, the hot water coil. Um, now, typical system takes cabin air, inside cabin air, brings it, brings it into the plenum, mixes it with outside air, uh, unless you're on research, mixes it with outside air 20%, takes it through the, the uh, blower pan, blower, and blows it all. All the air goes through the evaporator coil, cools it down, <coughs> cools it down and dehumidifies it. Then, in response to the temperature control system that we've talked about previously, this damper actuates, and that's basically all, all the temperature control does. <laughs> Is it runs one damper uh, for temperature control, where this damper either opens and all the air bypasses the heating coil, or modulates closed so that the air, uh, some of the air goes through the heater coil, and is warmed to a required to the required condition to to meet the space condition. Uh, we've got. Uh,
the specific for the funding various service payments. Again, the evaporator, put all the air goes through the evaporator core and then either bypasses or goes through the heater core. And then in accordance with the function of the system as the, as the controls see it, whether they're looking for heating or cooling or defrosting, the actuators change the direction of the air outlet flow. Cooling goes up, goes through the upper, upper uh, uh, outlets. Uh, uh, heating goes through the bottom because hot air goes, hot air goes down and cold air, uh, hot air comes up and cold air goes down. That's a, that's a, a fact of, of uh, thermodynamics that, that is irrefutable. So, uh, and if you're talking about the outside air, we talk about 20% or 0%. Uh, when you're on full air conditioning, the actuator shuts the outdoor air out inlet and you've got 100% research. So that means the system is using, it's, it's got less of a load on it. It doesn't have the outside of the air load. Now with that in mind, we go back to the other seminar. and you got vacuum. Now the reason they used vacuum was uh, they came up with this as a, it was, this was parallel to the then state-of-the-art commercial air conditioning which used pneumatic controls which operated on pressure. So I would imagine they had first thought about putting an air compressor on the car to power, power the, uh, the air conditioning control system but somebody said, well we have vacuum. So uh, they, used, they used vacuum instead of pressure to, actu to operate the actuator. They needed a way to control the vacuum. The control was through the transducer, through the power servo. Uh, service manual that I've seen every year, the helm, uh, 
original factory service manual is written in a manner which explains it in great detail. And they end up at the end of the, the air conditioning section with a matrix like this. And basically, <coughs> they show you Basically, they tell you what the, condi what the conditions are supposed to be at various settings. They've got the control lever settings from off to defrost, what the lower speed will be, uh, the inlet door uh, position, the temperature door position, uh, the mode doors, uh, and you know, it, it's a step-by-step process for diagnosis. There are no there are no quick solutions. We go to the next next one, uh, number number nine, yeah. Yeah. This is the, the blower system operation. You know if you've got one, two, you know, no blower in off or low settings, operates at low blower, blower then you typically your solution is one of these items. Now I've tried, and again, this is for, I, I don't remember what year this is. This is for one specific, out of one specific service <coughs> manual. They've all got a similar uh, matrix in there. Uh, uh, I've tried for years, I've tried to prove these things wrong, but I haven't been able to. Every time uh, I've got a, a car with a, with a problem, and I think it's something else other than what this thing tells me. I usually find I'm wrong. And I'm, I'm not usually, I've always found I'm wrong. So they've got a, there's a wealth of information in there, in the, uh, in the service <coughs> and uh, We've got, uh, somehow this, this went together better before. <laughs> Do we have any questions? I know you've got questions. Uh, and please don't hesitate to ask me to clarify anything I said. Yes, sir. Well, you know I've got problems. But the question I have is with regard to the programmer, the little plastic box, if, mm -hmm. is it possible to disassemble that to make sure there's no leaks in the programmer? Or is that a factory sealed part that cannot be yeah. unsealed? Could you get to slide number seven? Here's your programmer here. And again, this is 71 to, to I got it on my 79. Maybe this, I guess 79 will be the last one that you've got. You've got a programmer. You've got a vacuum line going through it. You've got vacuum line. You've got a plug on it, vacuum plug on it. And this, I think I did a better diagram. This shows the electronic plug here. Disconnect the electric plug and disconnect it to pull the vacuum plug off and the cover is held on there by two little studs with little retaining <coughs> clips on there. That comes off, you can get into it. Inside, you'll find vacuum checking valve, the power, the, the, they call it a vacuum actually, the power servo, and you find a little amplifier in there with a transducer. You've got all those components in there. Uh, they are actually serviceable. <laughs> But unfortunately, you really got to know what you're doing. Uh, meaning, you, meaning you've got to, on an amplifier, an amplifier, you've got to work with, uh, and you can do it from using a service manual. You can do it, there's nothing that you can't do by following that service manual. It tells you step by step. Uh, but the components in there are, are, are serviceable, they're replaceable. If they weren't, you wouldn't be able to buy rebuilt units. These are all the checking valve, the the power axis, power servo, the amplifier, and the transducer are all independently attached in there, along with the vacuum lines that somehow mysteriously all get put in there. It's very difficult to get back in the right place. <coughs> yes. Yeah, look, I, um, I don't know whether this is any value to anybody. I'm certainly not an air conditioning mechanic by any stretch of the imagination, and that's why I'm sitting here to see what else I can learn. 
but I had those programmers open on at least half a dozen occasions and had no trouble looking at them and playing with them and all the rest of it. And I, I spent probably five years trying to track down problems with the system in my 83 model and literally tore what little hair I've got in my head down and nothing helped. I read everything and everything and everything. And finally, one day, I was doing another job on the car and I had the programmer sort of out from where it's located and I had it laying in a different angle. And just by sheer coincidence, I tried the air conditioning and it worked famously. What had actually happened during the process of converting to right-hand drive, I had taken the programmer and found this great little location for it that I laid it on its side and I learnt that they don't like that. They, these programmers want to sit vertically. So it will probably not affect anyone else in this room, but who knows? Maybe some, someone might have an experience like that. But that was what I found. But I didn't find them hard to work on at all. So as you brought that up, uh, all of these components were intended to be installed and to operate in directionality, if you will, in a specific manner. They, they were intended for the wire connect, wiring connections to run in a specific order. They were intended to have good grounds. They were intended to like the, the uh, transducer in the early cars. It's, it, it, it's got a very weak spring in it, so it was intended to operate at a certain angle. So. Uh, it wouldn't have too too much work to do. Uh, one of the most important things in the system is number one. And again, I I believe that somebody I believe that the vacuum tube manufacturers of the era uh, built their fortunes on catalytic air conditioning systems. Uh, first, the most common problem with these systems, and that's any of them. The vacuum leaks, vacuum, vacuum hoses that are broken, bad ends. Uh, that, and that is the first thing that needs to be checked when you're diagnosing any problem, is the, uh, the, vacuum, the vacuum system. And it doesn't take much. Uh, and to show how, how they can fool you, uh, she had a vacuum leak on hers, and I was doing workarounds on it, you know, well, because I didn't, didn't chase down the vacuum leak until finally it, it bit me in the face. But without 100% vacuum tight integrity, uh, a leak any place in here screws the whole system up. A leak any place in, in the vacuum system just confuses the system. It, act, it doesn't know what to do. Um, I know extremely <laughs> little about anything that he said, which is probably a good thing, but I can tell you people that every time there's a problem with the air conditioning, I go, maybe it's a vacuum leak. And he always, and <laughs> he usually finds one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think along those lines, I've been troubleshooting my system too, my uh, AC and my 69. Uh, it's a limo, actually, surprisingly. After a recharge, when I got it, uh, everything's ice cold. <laughs> so the only time I run into a problem is once in a while when you know driving through maybe the neighborhood, uh, the blower uh, doesn't blow out of the vents; it starts coming out of the bottom. Uh, but on the highway, I've never had a problem with it when I'm going pretty fast. So just once in a while when you're around town, or maybe after the takes a few minutes, uh, and once in a while it will blow from the bottom where your feet are, as opposed to the I don't know if I should be focusing on uh, vacuum issues or... or well, sort of that might be his mode, uh, act, that might be the mode uh, uh, actuator on mine. I know one of the very first things when I first bought it, that little brown tan wire, the, actu the hose that feeds it, that directs it either from the top or to the bottom, it had just cracked the last inch and all I did was snip the last inch off, plugged it back in there and it worked fine. So that, that's my, my, my technology, that's part of my technology that I use for air conditioning. I call it the disre system. I disassemble things and then I reassemble them. Yep. And on electrical, I use that exclusively on, on electrical and uh, vacuum connections. Uh, these cars have been sitting around for a while, whether they have one mile on them or 10 million miles. Those electrical connections have been sitting there 
for, for decades. Yeah. And even though they look beautiful on the outside, they corrode on the inside and you get poor connection. Uh, and unless you've got, if we go back to uh, uh, number three, unless you've got good connections everywhere, uh, and there are multiple, we have multiple removable connect, multiple connections throughout the system so that all of these components are serviceable. serviceable. But unless uh, they've got a good connection, now remember we're just talking about a few ohms of different, few ohms of resistance through here. And if you've got a, a connector that's adding a few more ohms, uh, you're never going to get the right signal. But uh, taking the connector apart, and this is especially true for the in-car sensor, uh, and the, the ambient sensor, which typically is on the uh, on the heater box in the engine compartment. Uh, the what you're talking about, your programmer. Mm -hmm. Here's here's your connect. Here's your electrical connector for that. You know that's a big got a eight, eight connector plug. Uh, these wires in here on the uh, on the outside of the connector, the wires that connect to the plugs in, into the programmer, get pulled. Uh, if they're not all making good contact, uh, you're never going to get, again, you're never going to get the system to run correctly. Now, one thing I forgot to mention, the, the blower speed, because I don't have it in, in, my, in my hand up. Uh, I apologize for, for that. Next year it will be better. Uh, as the system goes from full heat to full cool, as the system goes from full heat to full cool, the vacuum actuated programmer pulls this lever around that goes, it's a, it goes, it hits multiple, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six resistor points. And as it moves, as the programmer goes from maximum heat to maximum air conditioning, it rotates this, this control, this contact around. So the blower speed goes from full blower speed to medium to low to back to, uh, back to low, medium, and high on the air conditioner. That's, that, that's all the magic that there is to that, uh, that temperature control. Uh, if you're, and typically if you're in a car and the temperature control, if, if by rotate with the air, with the air conditioning switch turned on with the control head, switch on the control head, turned to auto, if, if by, and the ignition turned on, if by rotating that temperature dial from maximum heat to maximum cool, slowly, uh, and the span speeds up over its full speed and maximum heat. If it slows down and then speeds up as you do it in response to that, chances are real good that you've got, uh, that your system works, that your programmer is okay. Because that, what that means is the power servo is, is off its cycling and there's not much else, to, there's not much else uh, and it also means that your sensors are connected and somewhere near the right area, the, the, the right calibration. If you, if you have an open in the sensor, you've got the, the, this NGAR sensor that's in the dash. Uh, if somebody forgets to plug that in, what do you have? You have maximum resistance in that circuit, which means your, if the, the system wants to go to full heat and there's nothing you can do to to get it off of full heat. So the fact that, that each one of these components in there is, is important. As uh, far as total resistance between this point and this point going to the, uh, to the, uh, to the amplifier. You've got, and I've got the numbers here because that's right, never remember the numbers. Thank 
example, let's go from 12 meters. You've got a, an ambient sensor, you've got your temperature outside is
pressure ratio, and that's the difference between the low pressure, the suction pressure, and the discharge pressure. And as the compression ratio goes up, and in this case we're just changing the discharge pressure, so we're raising the, the compression ratio. As the discharge pressure goes up, the efficiency of the, any compressor goes down. Uh, regardless of what refrigerant is pumping or, or any compressor, the, the efficiency goes down. And with 134A, a, a compressor designed for refrigerant 12 loses about 18 to 21 percent of its efficiency. In some, in some locales, it's irrelevant because these systems were designed to operate all over the world. So if you have a, if you're in a temperate climate, uh, if you might not experience, you might not have a problem. If you're in an extreme climate, we're down in southern Texas where we've got 100 degrees and 60 percent relative humidity. So we fall into that extreme condition. Uh, that 20 percent of what could have efficiency loss, uh, capacity loss, is enough to make the car uncomfortable in, in summertime traffic. Uh, Again, it's, it's, it's possible to modify an A6 compressor to operate on, on 134A. I've done it. I, I don't think we've got enough money left in our bank account for me to do another one. Uh, there are, there are uh, there's plenty of refrigerant 12 left. I'm a, if you've got a certification uh, and can buy refrigerant, there's also a refrigerant 414B, which was designed and intended to replace refrigerant 12 in existing commercial refrigeration system. I mean, reach-in boxes, beer boxes, uh, pie cases, little self-contained refrigeration systems that you see in restaurants. And they couldn't conceivably tell all those, all those people that don't use those that they had to buy new equipment. They would have been a, it would have been quite an uproar. Uh, so it was developed through i which is a major refrigerant manufacturer. It was certified by a a ARI. It was tested, uh, proved safe, compatible, et cetera, et cetera. That is a direct drop in for 12, and I use it in a couple of my cars. You know, but uh, you know, you've got to be certified to get it. Uh, it's on, it's ten dollars a pound. It's actually now I guess cheaper than in the original 134A. What's going to happen with 130? I did get on my on my soapbox here about refrigerant 134A. Uh, the European Union has declared that they will not allow any more automobiles with 134A in there because they decided that it is it it's a threat to to global warming. So in response to that, DuPont developed refrigerant HFO 1234YF. Uh, now, it is a valid refrigerant, and Cadillac motor car, in order to sell cars in Europe, started using HFO 1234YF. I heard that it's flammable if you get in an accident that can cause fire. I just got it on my own. Well, so is gasoline, but uh, uh, bear with me here. Uh, HFO 1234YF is uh, going to be going to be available somewhere around eighty dollars a pound. Uh, you buy thirty pound drums minimum. Uh, and you need four or five that piece of equipment costing four or five thousand dollars to install. The Europeans who were fighting, who were, were, were the Europeans who had patents on a carbon dioxide system, on a CO2 refrigeration system, were very unhappy with HFO 12345 because uh, they saw some lost revenue. They did a re test recently where a leak in the passenger compartment sparked by an ignition roasted the passengers. Uh, there is a little bit of propane in 12341. However, 
Uh, you know, there's actually 134A has got some flammability to it. Every refrigerant's got some flammability. Gasoline's got flammability to it. I'm not going to get into that. We don't talk about liability. But uh, the state of the art of refrigerant, bottom line, the state of the art of automotive refrigerant is in flux. And nobody, I, and I quit arguing, I quit caring which way it goes, because we have no, no influence on that. My emphasis at this point is R12, in this country, R12 is still available. It's a little bit costly, but it works. The systems were designed on it, system for it, and the systems operate on it. And when the systems, the R12 systems are operating correctly on R12, mean, correctly meaning the right temperatures at the right time, then the control systems work correctly. Yeah. Can you give me a price point on the R12? Just kind of. R12 is running about 50 bucks a pound wholesale. That's not that expensive. I mean, <coughs> you know, it's, it's easy to say. But a tank of gas costs what? You know? All depends on where you're at. Uh, you mentioned before that the compressor needed to be uh, you know, at least different. So if you change the compressor, uh, would you still get that 20% or so reduction if you went with a 134A uh, compressor versus the old R12? Or, or is it still other issues? Well, what? Yes and no. <laughs> because the replacement compressor, uh, the, the A6 compressor, the 12.6 cubic inch compressor, the displacement is 12.6 cubic inches. The replacement in that, um, I forget what manufacturer sells it, looks like an R6, supposedly drops right here. It's a 10 and a half cubic inch compressor. So there's a difference of 20%. That compressor is going to operate at a, at a better efficiency, but it's still going to have less capacity to pump. Uh, you can put a smaller pulley on it. Uh, you can do a lot of things. But, uh, you know, yeah, uh, the, also, one of the problems with, with R134A conversions is most of them cycle the compressors. And the reason being is they can't depend on a fixed temperature like the evaporator coil that we talked about before. If you don't have a fixed temperature at the evaporator coil, these controls will not work correctly. They hunt and you get, you know, it goes from heating and cooling to the fan speed will, battle, will fluctuate the temperature will fluctuate. Uh, so what they do typically on most of the quote conversions or many of the quote conversions, they cycle the compressor. Well, the A6 compressor is not designed to cycle. Uh, they tried, the General Motors tried it for a couple of years, I think. They forgot why it was that they didn't develop a cycling compressor system. That's, uh, that's uh, pulley on the compressor, and you end up with a one, almost a one and a half to one uh, ratio. In other words, the compressor is going one and a half times the engine speed. So if you've got the compressor off and you're driving 60 miles an hour and, and the compressor drives come on, it's going to immediately try to be running at somewhere around 4,000 RPM. And that's a little hard on the clutch and the internals. And apparently, apparently, my guess is there's enough people trying to do that that Delco quit making new compressors and also quit making, quit rebuilding their compressors. AC Delco is out of the compressor business right now, anyhow. So it's not a good way to do it. I can't, yeah. I, I'm led to believe that the aviation industry has a dispensation to R12 and all aircraft with um, AC installations run and use R12 because it's considered the only safe gas to use in an airplane. Yeah. So with that in mind, you'd have to believe that R12 might be available for a little bit longer. However, um, I, I really wonder at times just what that means because in my country, it's a seriously outlawed substance. And indeed, if I was to take a can of it back in my luggage, I'd be facing a jail cell. You know, so, so, you know, I, I, with that, you mentioned, uh, was it 114B or something like that? 414B, probably, I think I, I talked to uh, the Bruce Reynolds down in Tasmania, and that's the go-to 
number seven, right? These are rotary valves, and they're two flat discs with holes drilled in them and a cork gasket between them. And as it as it rotates, the whole the ports line up with each other, line up in the right order. It's a it's a nightmare. It's something I've never tried to really figure out. <laughs> but if they get a little dirt in them, uh, and, and remember, you take an engine vacuum. Uh, so when the car shuts off, you're getting that vacuum back, or you're getting you're connected to the engine. So it's real possible to get all kinds of debris coming back into the into this system. Uh, get a little bit of something, it doesn't take much. Uh, it plugs up one of the ports, and then again the system gets confused. Uh, it's cranky. Uh, they work, they work great when they work. Uh, anybody have any other questions? I apologize for, oh yeah, yeah, I just want to, uh, 414, is that a direct replacement for our 12? There's no different carrier on the gap to it? 414B is, you know, it, I've talked to refrigeration people who have actually used it to add in commercial refrigeration have actually added 414B to a, an existing R12 system while it's in operation. Uh, they've added it and supplemented I personally have not done that, but they say you, you can. That was its intent. That was its intent. Again, working for those systems, for the refrigeration, <coughs> commercial refrigeration system, you're talking about systems, well, I, I shouldn't say it's a couple of pounds of refrigerant, just about the same as we've got in our car. So, um, <coughs> you know, it, it's a, it, was, it is a legal, authorized, encouraged uh, drop in for as well. And again, I, I would assume that that's going to be around for a while. Okay. My air conditioning is not blowing hot air, so what would that mean? Is that legal? Yeah. Not blowing what? It's blowing hot air. It used to blow cool and now it's blowing warm air. Well, first thing I would do is check your refrigerant, make sure the compressor is running, and check your refrigerant level. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, the first thing to check when you think you have a control problem is to check the basic systems. Check the, the fan system, make sure the fan's running, Check the compressor and the refrigerant system to make sure that you've got a you've got a, a, a fully operational refrigerant system. And check the, the hot water that hot water heating system to make sure the heating valve is, is working. Uh, once you've done that, and make sure and assure yourself that the system as systems are operating correctly, then you can go to the controls. Then you can start fine tuning it. Anybody else got any, any symptoms? Uh, all right, well I, well, I thank you all for being here. Um, I've got some cards up there, and you know, I'd, I'd be glad if you've got any problems with any of, you know, any of your systems, don't hesitate to give me a call. Each one, each one is different. Each, each year and each version of the automatic temperature control changed, it was modified, and I tried to cover the basics of all of them, but some of them have got some real strange idiosyncrasies, uh, and I've, waited, I've determined those, I've discovered those over the years. Uh, I'm glad to help you with, with anything that, anything that's not worth it. Uh, Thank you. Thank you.